What a great song. So many times we have this yearning for something in our lives. And we tend to fill that something with all kinds of junk. A, a void in our lives that God created for only Him and His Spirit to fill. But we tend to want to fill that void with all kinds of stuff. It could be materialistic things, which seems like our society is really heavy, isn't it? Uh, it could be drugs or alcohol or sex or just something because we all thirst and hunger for something in our lives to fulfill us. And if we try to fill that void with something other than what it was meant to be, then we always feel empty. And uh, as you can kind of tell that our theme today is about water. Um, but, you know, we're, we're watching the Olympics. Some of you are watching the Olympics uh, right now. And as far as, yeah, I, I know you are. <laughs> I heard about it. And you probably go out and play beach ball or something and like, act like you're one of the competitors, right? And you want to win the gold. But the thing is, uh, um, you probably see the Gatorade commercials, right? Or then you see the uh, athletes drinking uh, Gatorade or, or water or something. Mark, you got your Gatorade right there, right? Show everybody your Gatorade. <laughs> so the thing is, uh, and, and uh, Stevie's got some water over there. I got my water over there. But you know, that water is something that is really important and, and liquids that, that when, when we're running through life, we will end up running dry. And if we don't quench that thirst that we are, we're seeking, we're going to end up pretty messed up, right? Just like these athletes. And, and I don't know how many of you saw that, um, the bike race. How many of you saw the bike race? Anybody? I was watching the bike race. It's kind of late at night. And here's this uh, woman. I can't remember what country she was from. She was in the lead. And pretty soon, she hit something. And she went head over heels. I think she broke her collarbone. And then America, the USA biker, was in the lead, and she was, you know, just keep, she was all the way to the end. But you know what? There's three people that are behind her at the end, passed her up, and she ended up fourth. Wow. That's pretty sad, right? How, can you imagine how she felt? That here she was in the lead the most of the time, and then towards the end, she ended up not getting anything at all. That's pretty sad, right? And you know, the thing is that we uh, are in a pursuit. We're in this competition in life, right? We are running the race, like Paul would say. And, and all of us want to complete that race. We want to finish the race. And we want to receive a prize. And we don't want to come up empty. And we want that thirst and yearning for something in our lives to be filled. And only one thing can fill that, right? And we remember the story. Uh, that, that Jesus was, uh, you know, back in those days, right, they didn't have cars, so they did a lot of walking. And of course, uh, it says here, therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but where his disciples were, he left Judea, and you know the map, right, he's up here, and he went again to Galilee, and had passed through Samaria. Now most of the Jews, they hated Samaritans, and so they would go the long way around Samaria, but Jesus went through Samaria. And I think Jesus was intentional to go through Samaria because he had a plan. And we, we just got back, uh, Randy and I went to the Global Leadership Summit, and uh, John Maxwell was one of the speakers, and, and he uh, basically said that we, the simple message is that we have to value people. If you value people, are you going to hurt them? Are you going to steal from them? Are you going to kill them? Are you going to cheat them? You know? And, and, and if we can just learn to value people, we can go and go up to the counter at the grocery store and they make a mistake, we'll have grace and we'll value them as people. And I thought that was a pretty good, simple message. And Jesus valued 
the Samaritans, even though they were half Jews, and the Jews really hated the Samaritans. But not only is, is Jesus going to the Samaritans, but he actually, another thing that Jews didn't like is to associate, the men didn't associate with the women. And here he, he comes to the well, and what happens? It says, so he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour, there came a woman to Sam of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, now it doesn't sound strange, right, for you know, you're thirsty, and you go ask a person that has a bucket that can lend the bucket down into the, the well and, 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 and draw some water. It doesn't sound strange, but just the fact that Jesus is asking a woman, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water, this is, you know, different. And it says, For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy some food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me, a woman, for a drink. Since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is asking you for, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, you know, here's that woman, you know, here's this stranger, a Jew, asking for a drink of water, and, and she's kind of wondering why he, a Jew, is asking a woman, a Samaritan woman of all, for a drink of water. She's kind of confused. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? So here in this uh, circumstance is Jesus, of course, is speaking in spiritual terms, right? Uh, uh, and the woman is thinking just what? Physical terms. And how many times we as Christians tend to get this mixed up? When, when the scripture teaches us things about spiritual things and we kind of relate that to physical, and we need to understand that there's a lot of things that the that Jesus teaches in his parables and all that, he has some, something concrete that we can touch and feel and smell, but he's talking about spiritual matters. You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well and, and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now if you can imagine being the woman and hearing this from this man, you know, what are you talking about? Again, remember, she's thinking about physical, physical water, something that you can touch and feel. But Jesus is talking about himself, really, and that he can give that living water. The, work, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty, nor come to all, all the way here to uh, draw. And, and she said, he said to her, Go. Go call your husband. Now, remember, Jesus knows all things, so he knows what's going on to her head, right? But he says, go call your husband. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not, it's not your husband. This you have said truly, the woman said to him. I perceive that uh, you're a prophet. 
Our fathers worship, uh, and here it is, you know, we, when, we, when we get convicted, we tend to change the subject, and this is what she's doing. She's changing the subject. And she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is. It's, it's here now. The time is right now. And, and he's basically telling I am right here. Salvation is right here. I am salvation. When the true worships, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. Now, can you imagine? Maybe she's talking to Jesus, and so she's talking about somebody else not realizing who she's talking to, right? I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. So remember, Samaritans were half Jews, so they kind of knew about the Messiah, right? And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said, now get this. Now if you were that Samaritan woman, someone said to you, I, who speak to you, is that person the Christ, the Messiah. Can you imagine what went through her mind? At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed. Now, again, look at the culture, right? Here's his disciples come. What in the world are you doing speaking to that Samaritan <coughs> woman? And yet, no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak to her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things I have done. Now, hey, you probably know how town gossip is, right? Probably those people that she was saying come knew all about what this woman did. She was a loose woman that slept with all different, you know, had five husbands, and the one that she was with wasn't even her husband, right? And, he's, and, and here's this woman saying, Come. This man over here, he, he's got to be something special. And they went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were are, uh, urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Again, here's the disciples thinking about physical. You know, you got to eat, man. You haven't eaten. You need something to eat, physical. But Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know scripture. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, right? Physical. And Jesus said to them, my food, spiritual, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not, do you not say that if there's four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, look, look at the fields. Look at, look here, look at it. It's white for harvest. And already he who reaches receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. Now, now didn't he just say that the harvest isn't ready yet? Right? But now he say, look, the fields are white for harvest. There's a lot of people out there that are thirsty and hungry for, for me, is what he's saying. It's time to reap that harvest. Gather and receive wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, spiritual. Behold, I say to you, uh, let's see. Already he who is, re re is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. You see, there's going to be people that talk to people about the Lord. And then there's going to be people that lead other people to Jesus Christ. For in this case, 
the saying is true. One sows and the other reaps. And I send you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all of these that I have done. They don't even mention her name. But because of this one woman, understanding this man, this Jesus, who had the, the substance to fill that void that she was looking for. In her circumstance, she was trying to find her fulfillment in men. And what one, one, the first husband didn't fulfill her, she got rid of that one and went and found another one. And you can see that this is a pattern with a lot of people in our society today, right? They're looking for something to fill that void and, and, and they, they will participate in something and, and, and take it and it doesn't fulfill them. So, so what they do is instead of looking for something else that will fulfill them, they seem to want more of the same thing. And in AA, they say that if you do the same thing and expect different results, what is that called? Insanity. Insanity. And how many people are doing that? You know, if I can get this car, this brand new car, it will make me happy. So they go out and yeah, in the first few weeks, you know, they're driving along and, and wow, yeah, I'm happy. Then pretty soon, you know, Somebody scratches their car and they're not too happy, right? And then pretty soon they get into an accident. They're not happy, right? And pretty soon they want another car. I mean, I've seen people have a brand new car and a year later they're trading that in for another brand new car. What kind of sense does that make? You know, they say that once you drive that car off the lot, it loses, it depreciates a couple thousand dollars. Three to four thousand dollars. But they're over there trying to fulfill that empty spot, and they keep on getting further and further in debt because they are hungry and thirsty for something that only Jesus can fill. It says, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. <coughs> now again, remember, here, here's the Samaritans who hated the Jews, the Jews hated the Samaritans, but here, here's a man who is revealing truth to them, and what do they do? They invite Jesus into their home. Now there's another uh, story that we've heard before, right? The man Zacchaeus, remember? He was hated by the, the, the people, right? Because he cheated them, and he would, he would take more than what belonged to him, but that's how tax collectors made their money. But, uh, you know, Zacchaeus uh, was wanting to look, get fulfilled, right? He was thirsty, he was hungry for the truth. So he climbs up the tree, right? And then he sees Jesus coming, and Jesus places value in Zacchaeus. And he, and, and he's, he knows Zacchaeus' name. He says, Zacchaeus, what? Come on. Oh, we eat it. What did he say? You come down. For I am going to your house today. I'm going to fellowship with you. I'm going to stay with you. Here's Jesus who, who, who values Zacchaeus to say, I want to be a part of your life. I want a relationship with you. And the same way that the Samaritans, they wanted, a re they wanted to know they found the key to fill that thirst and the hunger that they had. So he says, we want you to come and stay with us. And he says that he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. And I, you skip a couple of chapters. And, and here's Jesus again. He said to them, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never.